You got anything to say? It's your right, you know. That's my right, is it, Judge? The young fella I put a hole in had too much mouth, not enough brains. I'd invite him out again tomorrow if I had it to do all over again. You shot my son in the back, Castle. And that's a long country mile from an invitation to a showdown. Now, if that's all you got to say, I got this to add. I'd like it to take a while. I'd like you to feel it, Caswell. The more you kick, the more justice I figure there is in the world. <laughs> well, I'll do a jig for you, Pappy. Just like a puppet. Hello, and welcome to The Twilight Pwn, the internet's third most popular Twilight Zone podcast. My name is John. I'm joined by my co-host, Fred. Hello. How are you this week, Fred? I'm good. I'm, I'm mostly better. There'll, there'll be fewer sniffles to edit out. It's, it's kind of funny. I I was pretty concerned about making it to the podcast on time today because my girlfriend and I went to go see The Martian, and I didn't realize it was oh, like cool. four and a half hours long. Had you read the book yet? I haven't read the book, no. But, I mean, you having read the book, and most people know it's about, you know, Matt Damon gets stuck on Mars, and it's like a testament to, like, human right. ingenuity and, like, That's you what know. the book's about. It was a major Matt, get. Yeah. It was a major get that they actually got yeah. Matt Damon. He's yeah. kind of like being John Malkovich. Or something. Yeah. You know, it's all about, like, human ingenuity and, like, science and grit and love and determination to, like, try and get this guy home from Mars. And, like, you leave the theater all pumped up. And, like, my girlfriend and I got on, like, the subway, and it just stopped moving. And I was like... I got nothing. Like, I'm screwed. <laughs> Couldn't get yeah. myself home if I, you know. I would just die the first day on Mars. Awesome. Uh, but enough about me. You have had quite an exciting yeah. day. Yeah, no, that's a very neat little day you had. Uh, <laughs> I decided I was going to do something a little bit more interesting. I figured, you know, why not? I'm going to rub shoulders, press the flesh with some TZ luminaries. Oh, yeah. So uh, I found out late last night that there is a annual event in the pittsburgh area called monster bash this year monster bash decided to dedicate its programming to twilight zone monster bash zone john that's what the t-shirt said fred yeah i got there in time to see the you know sunday morning tail end of any convention program and you know the upshot is i got to meet miss ann serling nice rod's daughter nice. got a copy of her book i'll try and I got a pile of stuff I'm working through (laughs) somewhere before then. Get a little review to you. And I got to talk in person with none other than great friend of the show, Mr. Martin (sighs) Graham Jr. Wow. That is crazy. I know it hurts, Fred. (laughs) You're kind of just off in your little dusty, you know, neck of the woods. People don't really get to. I'm in the berg now. (laughs) Big city boys. (laughs) I don't know how much longer I can keep you on the cast. I know it's a little provincial out there in Brooklyn. You don't get (laughs) You don't get Monster Bash like we do. The amazing thing is that Monster Bash was counter-programmed against Zombie Fest yesterday. Ooh. A bold move. Uh, I don't know. It's ballsy, but I feel like we could devote like a special episode just to your experience at Monster Bash. I mean, do you did what did you chat with Ann Serling about? You know, I politely brought up the podcast, and she politely looked disinterested or <laughs> confused, or you know, I think she. When I tried to, you know, explain that it was playful, I I don't know how much she was receptive to it but i will say her husband was there too they were both Mm. extremely nice and we talked a little bit about the rod serling conference that's held in ithaca on a biannual basis because they actually live in the area so they they were just very very friendly people cool did you run your rod imitation by her no (laughs) okay cool grams and i chatted for a while and we connected over old time radio apparently (laughs) shock of shocks grams is a fan and i'm a fan so who would have thought (laughs) (laughs) so that's enough all right all right well i'm sure we'll probably be revisiting (laughs) you know i mean every year we do have our monster bash three-part episode right so this is uh yeah i'm a little too close to monster bash right now i need need to get some perspective on this year's bash (laughs) god okay uh well what episode of the twilight zone are we talking about this week uh this week we will be talking about execution this was a first season episode the 26th of the production run it aired originally on april 1st 1960 commonplace if somewhat grim unsocial event known as a necktie party the guest of dishonor a cowboy named joe caswell just a moment away from a rope a short dance several feet off the ground and then the dark eternity of all evil men mr joe caswell who when the good lord passed out a conscience a heart of feeling for fellow men must have been out for a beer and missed out mr joe caswell 
in the last quiet moment of a violent life. In the Twilight Zone. I feel like Sterling was kind of playing at our level with that unsocial <laughs> event and guest of dishonor. There was yeah. like a real Simpsons treehouse of horror vibe to yeah. it. I also like to out for a beer when the good Lord <laughs> was handing out souls. That was a good Yeah, it one. made me think of like, yeah, that's a god I'd really like to get a beer with. You know, <laughs> I wouldn't vote for that god, but you know, he yeah. just seems like a good guy. Nice. Topical. <laughs> so we like to write our own Sterling style intros. I know you've been busy hobnobbing with the greats with M- yeah. MG. J, but did you have time to do one this week? If so, you're first. Yeah. Yes, yes. Here we go. Western scene. The peculiar party commonly called a necktie party, a sash bash, a cravat fet, a feather boa bicu, a scarf lark, a shawl ball, a bandolier black tie affair, or a big baller collar bash. <laughs> Soon the party's participants will begin a rousing round of that classic tune for he's a jolly dead fellow. To Joe Caswell, a scummy blah blah blah, I hate my characters kind of guy. <laughs> Mr. Joe Caswell with one neck in a rope and one toe precariously balanced on the edge of the Twilight Zone. <laughs> nice. I think uh, once again, we both grabbed for the <laughs> enticingly low-hanging fruit <laughs> presented by Sir It's like, ah, he said something funny in the first four words. I got it. <laughs> yeah. I know what I'm doing. Just, I'll just tune out for the rest of it. <laughs> okay, here's mine. Submitted for your RSVP, an invitation to a <laughs> necktie party, a swing tree soiree, a hangman's hangout, a state-sanctioned murder BBQ. <laughs> and the debutante at this little do is one Joe Caswell. The only thing Mr. Caswell does well is Caz. He's a waste <laughs> of a human who's wasted so many humans that his rap sheet reads like a phone book. But before this necktie party can get going and this sad grunt of a man can get his just desserts at the business end of a noose, he commits the ultimate party foul. Time travel. But there's only so far in space or in time a man can run from his own nature. So the party's still on. It starts at 8. Show up at 9. Bring some brews if you can. We've got to keep it quiet because my landlord lives downstairs. But it should be cool. And hey, if no one shows up, we'll watch The Twilight Zone. (laughs) <laughs> nice. yeah, kind of pulling at a lot of different straws there. Yeah. Just hoping some punches it's starting will Starting to land. get kind of real, I feel like, in the... Well, but do parties get communicated, in, you know, in real person-to-person talk anymore? Like, that felt like a throwback to <laughs> true, like late 90s, true. early 2000s. Yeah. Like, I feel like there's just a Facebook event, and no one, you never know if anyone's actually going to be there. Well, if you look at my notes, I wrote that all out in emojis, so... <laughs> <laughs> I had to read that out loud. Anyway, it's a first season episode. Um, if you want to check it out before we get going, please do. It's on Netflix and Hulu and all the usual places. But we're about to spoil it, so consider yourself warned. We open on uh, the aforementioned necktie party. Did, well, yours were kind of more based around the scarf aspect of it. Yes, I, I googled neckwear. <laughs> I went that yeah. angle. It was really good. It was a big baller collar. What was that one? <laughs> Big collar baller. Big baller collar bash. That was, that was a good one. Um, anyway, it's a necktie party, uh, a.k.a. a hanging. The man to receive the necktie is a bad hombre named Joe Caswell. And it's the guy from of late, I think, of Cliffordsville. Cliffordville. Hmm. Well, that was a real town, wasn't it, Hackett? A real place. Yeah, I don't know. It's a real, like, two-for-two two Albert Salmi punch <laughs> of bizarre accents. I read a number of reviews because I was feeling a little conflicted about this episode and a lot of people really slathered on the praise to salmi and said Hmm. like boy he really like made a great character and i think they really thought like i got the feel it was kind of like a daniel day lewis like boy (laughs) he's really accurate in this archaic strange way of speaking and i just couldn't i don't know i'm like or maybe Albert Salmi is just weird. Yeah. Is it, is it possible that he's just weird? I think it's interesting. Um, you know? <laughs> let's, let's yeah, I on. feel like I'm an acting teacher, and he's yeah. just done his read, and I'm like, that was interesting, Albert. Yeah. That's interesting, interesting choices. choices. <laughs> yes. yes. Caswell is about to be hanged or hung. I'm not sure which one's hanged. right. Hanged. He's about to be hanged. The preacher comes up and um, Caswell's not even interested in the last prayers. And in kind of a cool effect shot, we sort of pan away from the, the shadow of uh, Caswell in the noose. And then Caswell disappears and the noose is empty. And everyone's like, oh my gosh, what happened? <laughs> and that's kind of the, you know, the Twilight Zone kicker that gets this episode rolling. Yeah, I thought it was an interesting, if not like particularly great effect, because I mean... You know, you got the shadow disappearing instead of the guy. As the yeah. So, I mean, I, I mean, I could kind of, like, 
work out how they did it. It worked okay, but it kind of it made me think like, yeah, they couldn't figure out how to do this <laughs> yeah. looking at the guy. So. Yeah, I sort of disagree because I think that if they'd shown him fading out, it just would have kind of looked goofy, you know what I mean? Well, like, that's what I'm, I'm saying. Like, they couldn't find a way to yeah. make it compelling, yeah. like, actually showing the guy. So yeah, like, yeah, yeah this will be better. Yeah, no, I hear you. I hear you. It's like a one of those, like, 50-50 cop-out artistic effect, mm-hmm. you know, hard to right. tell. Anyway, um, Caswell wakes up um, 80 years in the future, mm-hmm. and he's, li- he's lying on a table, and he's being examined by, like, an f- anonymous 50s scientist guy sort of explaining, you know, that he's brought Caswell not only forward in time, but I'm also s- sort of confused about this. He sort of brought him, like, forward in space as well. Because I, I don't think 80 years ago New York City looked like the Old West, you know? Well, I mean, that's just a constant issue with time travel. I mean, just think of the rotation of the Earth and around the sun and oh, everything. Man. Like, I've never thought of that before. Yeah, you got to think <laughs> about these things. For, you know, I actually once I had a, just had some weird epiphany about time travel for like a story maybe. And I yeah. jotted down some notes in like a just a little text file on my desktop. And then I don't know why, but for some reason, some of my high school friends, this was like five years like not a long time ago and for some reason some of my high school buddies were around and saw my computer and like opened up the time travel (laughs) file and read it and we're just like oh boy john (laughs) what's going on i wasn't around because i was at monster bash that weekend (laughs) there's a gag on that in red dwarf the like british sci-fi show i like a lot where they get a time machine and they're in a spaceship and they're like oh let's go back to i don't know 1492 or something and they hit the button and they travel back in time and they're still floating in space. But it's yeah. like, it's 1492. How cool. Like, yeah, that's that's cool. Yeah. We'll just put that aside for now. He's traveled forward in time and also to New York City. And he's currently mm-hmm. being uh, examined by this, you know, 50s scientist lab coat wearing dude. And he's mm-hmm. explaining that he brought Caswell forward using this, like, time device. It kind of looks right. like a Daft Punk stage prop was my take on it. Wasn't that... A prop from uh, Hocus Pocus and Frisbee? Oh, was it? Maybe it was something that the aliens had in their ship. Which I think in turn was like probably a used prop from either the Time Machine or Forbidden Planet. Yeah, I, I mean, one. it's just like a sort of anonymous, sciencey looking I, gizmo. Yeah. Um, right off the bat, I was struck by the fact that the time travel office was like so dark. Yeah, Like why Moody. did he? Why did he choose like... You know, one in the morning <laughs> to like, it's his time to like begin the, you know, begin the experiment. And why do you turn all the lights off? When you're a scientist working in time travel, you're kind of <laughs> pushing the boundaries true, of true. science. So you got to expect a little quirkiness. Or maybe like he didn't pay his bills or something like that. I don't know. Maybe it's like a time travel startup. <laughs> yeah, he just needs to get some VC in there, and you know they'll really hit the ground running. Yeah, exactly. It's got yeah, this minimum... is like part of his Kickstarter video yeah. that he's putting together. Yeah, for Timeo or whatever. <laughs> anyway, um, the scientist dude uh, is sort of you know giving Caswell a, a look, and he sees that um, there's like a neck injury, the the rope mm-hmm. burn on Caswell's neck, so he starts to get a little suspicious of who this uh, guy he brought forward in time may actually really be. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we cut away, and the scientist dude is recording his time travel podcast. (laughs) Time (laughs) bone. (laughs) Now, he's reading into, like, a dictation machine. I was wondering, is that, like, a dictation machine that Serling actually used? I thought that'd be Mm. a cool little Easter egg if it were, but... I feel like, wasn't there some episode, like, A World of His Own or something yeah. that had Serling's actual dictaphone? Yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure that's another episode. It didn't. It's not mentioned in Grams, but it's, it's, yeah. it's, if it's not the exact same one, it's, it's probably a similar kind of machine. Yeah. So, yeah, he's recapping some of his notes, like any good doctor. And, yes. uh, yeah, he's got right. some, some totally reasonable thoughts on the patient. I have one other observation. It's hardly scientific. I don't like his looks. <laughs> I don't like the eyes or the face or the expression. I get a feeling of disquiet. I, I get a feeling that I've taken a 19th century primitive and placed him in a 20th century jungle. And heaven help whoever gets in his way. <laughs> the film noir time scientist. <laughs> right. Yeah, and I mean, I don't know. Salmi is, like, menacing enough, but yeah. I, I just... 
I don't know if he's sold it enough for the doctor <laughs> yeah. to like really have nailed him so so well. Yeah, I, I also just love the you know another thing. I don't like his looks. At 0800 <laughs> hours, I just attempted to give him a makeover. <laughs> like it's right. not exactly appropriate scientific notes, but anyway, whatever. Caswell interrupts this recording sesh, and he wants to know what the world out there looks like, and the time travel startup office conveniently has giant windows with big curtains over them. I was really hoping he'd like dramatically pull back the curtains and it'd be like a brick wall or something like that, or a parking <laughs> lot. No such irony takes place because he's right on Times Square with his time travel startup and it's mm-hmm. weird too because suddenly there's like not only this city landscape but also a lot of noise it's like was that one curtain like a sound blocking curtain or yeah it was fill- the baffling right. it's just amazing on that. <laughs> yeah, that very thin linen curtain but apparently all you know <laughs> all these horns just start honking and salmi's like oh god the modern world we've all been there am i right fred uh, yeah i mean sometimes oh, you just gotta get away to pittsburgh <laughs> To Monster Bash. <laughs> to Monster Bash. Just take a little time off. Yeah. Where everybody a knows your name. Time. <laughs> Monster Bash. It's not like those hectic, you know, New York City Dragon Cons or yeah. Comic Cons or whatever. Just, yeah, just like a little Willoughby of <laughs> yeah. Cons. Everyone's sitting at their booth sipping lemonade. <laughs> <laughs> their feet up on their merch table. The scientist kind of starts accusing Caswell of being a criminal pretty quickly. It's... It's like a scientist slash PI. Like, he gets really, like, I don't know, like, really, like, high and mighty about, like, I have to send you back in time because you committed a murder. Like, I. Yeah, they're they're kind of having it out. Doc clearly has surmised that this guy is a, I don't know, cattle rustler from about 1892. (laughs) Ooh. Yeah. Uh,. And uh, he starts kind of browbeating ugly, and I mean Albert. <laughs> and, and Albert has some some really interesting kind of like uh, crime and punishment, Karamazov style yeah. thoughts on justice and punishment. Mister, you're just talking words. Justice, right and wrong. They sound good in this nice warm room and a nice full stomach just a few feet away from a soft bed. They sound nice and they go down easy. But you just try them on an ice cold mesa where another man's bread or another man's jacket stands between you and staying alive. You get in this machine of yours and you go back to where I was and you talk about your law and your order and your justice. They're gonna sound different. I know your kind. You're clean faced, you're Johnny come lately <laughs> dandies. You come out in your warm trains rolling over the graves of men like me. I just hate your kind. Yeah. Are you guys feeling that these guys are like a buddy cop kind of movie <laughs> yeah. just waiting to happen? Yeah. Like he's a crazy old West guy and he's a nerdy uptight scientist and together they're gonna solve a bank robbery or something yeah. like i sort of started to sound a little bit like the speech from a few good men in there you know Ooh. like on your dusty mesa you talk about the truth well you can't <laughs> i don't know right this is a total non sequitur but when the scientist guy is talking about sending salmi back to like face justice for his hangings I just had the kind of like really random thought of like it would be amazing if the scientist peeled off a mask and it was the sheriff from the old west (laughs) being like i followed you here i don't know i kind of thought there was a chance they were gonna send the uh professor back or have i don't know i thought their time travel would pay off in a different way than it subsequently did and you didn't have to make another time travel out of old west coconuts (laughs) Right, right. That whole big speech, that speechifying, gets heated pretty mm-hmm. quickly, and they get into a fight. I thought it was pretty visceral and good. I don't, I don't know what your feelings were. Like, there's a, there's a fight later on that we'll discuss maybe in more detail. But this one I thought was pretty cool. This fight was acceptable. Yeah, and it ends with the scientist trying to pull a gun on Caswell, but he, you know, grabs it, uh, knocks the scientist out, and uh, runs out the door just as the dictaphone machine falls on the uh, ground and. The podcast starts playing again. Caswell rushes out to give it a negative review on iTunes. Right. And uh, outside, 
Caswell is wandering around the Loudhorn district of whatever city this is. Mm -hmm. He's very confused by, you know, the modern day world. We got these like canted angles and he almost gets hit by a car and he stumbles into a Well, you know, Fred, he's from eighteen ninety. At that time New York City was nothing more than like a hill and some some rubble. Maybe one horse running around in a circle. I mean it's not like New York City's been around for much more than 30 40 years <laughs> yeah i mean i kind of i do wonder about this because this is the cliche like you know applicable to almost Any the many time, time travel, travel fish out of water where, yeah. yeah where people yeah. are like i remember it from the buster keaton episode too like buster keaton is just like so oppressed by the noise but i sort of feel right. like e- even in modern day cities like it gets loud but it's not like human ears have like evolved differently you know what i mean yeah and the buster keaton one it seemed more justified because it was a silent to noise it kind of like fit yeah. with the overall architecture of the episode i don't know i mean yeah there'd be more car horns and everything you know what would be really different i remember reading some history of new york in the 19th century he'd be overwhelmed by how good it smells yes yeah, exactly because you know? there wouldn't be horse crap absolutely yeah. everywhere in the streets yeah. he'd be like wow it's noisy but this isn't repulsive okay. i also think it was probably pretty noisy back in the day as well maybe that's what his shock is about he's like clean access to services <laughs> <laughs> a lack yeah. of abject poverty yeah there's not like a dead kid in the street this is unbelievable yeah I know. I mean, I think it's safe to assume that, like, he's a bit of, like, a, a country mouse, you know? Yeah. Like, we, we can't assume that this character has been to New York City even in 1890, but I agree. It's absurd. It's not absurd so much as, like, it's a little cliche. Yeah. And, I don't know. They don't do anything to make it unique or interesting. Yeah. It's just like, oh, lo- it, loud noises. He also, like, ends up wandering into a phone booth, and that confuses him so much that he has to, like, smack <laughs> his way out. Like, how did this guy get away with well, one murder, let alone 20? <laughs> like, To be fair, if you put, like, your average tween teenager today in a phone booth, they'd probably <laughs> panic, too. They would have I no mean, idea I, what it is. Yeah. They'd probably just smash up. <laughs> yes, he's never seen that kind of door before, but it's not like that immediately turns into panic. I don't know. Like, if I'm, like, in Europe and I see, like, a door with a different mechanism, I don't just, like, pull a gun and start shooting, you know? Isn't it more likely he'd just think it was some kind of weird, modern, newfangled outhouse? Like, yeah. <laughs> if you put it in the cultural context, he understands? Yeah, well, CBS had to censor that one. <laughs> right. Anyway, he wanders off the street um, into a bar... They've got a Joey Crown record on, and Caswell doesn't like it, so he smashes the jukebox with a chair and uh, gets some whiskey, and then there's yet more opportunity for Caswell doesn't like the present-day hijinks when the bartender, who's kind of scared, gives him a whiskey, and then they talk about this TV, and they turn on the TV. Yeah, I've got a little clip here. I mean, it wouldn't be a time travel episode if the character from the past didn't get confused by a television. Oh, yeah. All right, hombre. You got your chance to draw. Now you better make your move. <laughs> all right, cowboy, you gotta pay for this. Police! Yeah. Turn it yeah. on to the all shootout channel. <laughs> it's always someone looking directly in camera, yes, yelling, exactly. and or saying something. It's never like a bugles commercial. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly. never just. <laughs> well, what, what there should be is there should be a cable channel just dedicated to that so that if someone actually does manage to come through time, everyone will be ready to surprise them <laughs> with that. Anyway, Caswell runs out into the street and that's when the S really hits the fan because mm-hmm. he just like almost gets hit by a car and he starts shooting in random directions. and then <laughs> Yeah, that one it was kind of intense. He just yeah. kind of shoots into the car and... It's really not entirely clear if he just murdered someone. Like, I kind of thought, just being on television at that era, I kind of thought they'd show, like, the person behind the wheel, like, jumping out in terror or the car moving on or something. But they don't. And you could imply that he just murdered someone, like, shot him in the face and ran off. I think in the script he does shoot the guy, but CBS sort of asked that they make it not grisly and overly violent. And so... I think the implication is that he does actually shoot the driver. Cool. (laughs) Cool. Awesome. So the guy really died? That's great. Uh, Salmi slash Caswell wanders back to the relative safety of the time travel startup. The scientist is still knocked out cold. Is he knocked out cold? I assumed he was dead. Oh, 
I don't know. Maybe it was like one of those 50s deaths where you get punched in the <laughs> face and you die. I just kind of assumed he was dead since he's like still lying there, you know. Yeah, but it's only like 20 minutes later. later. I mean, the guy like ran out and was just like very hyperactively, you know. I mean, I'm sure all of the medical professional fans of the show can say <laughs> like if you stay unconscious for 20 minutes, things aren't going well. I don't think that's yeah. just like a hard punch to the head. Fair, fair, fair. Well, he's I don't know. I mean, I mean, I feel like if he's dead, then it's even darker, you know? It's like, the right. body count's really getting up there in this episode. So at this point, we meet a, a new character. Um, mm-hmm. A cat burglar comes in to steal some <laughs> stuff. It's kind of funny because mm-hmm. it doesn't feel that crazy in the context of the episode, but just reading it out loud, it's like, yeah, that's a very eventful evening around <laughs> Time Travel Inc. <laughs> the cat burglar comes in, and he perceives it as, like, he's interrupting another burglary in progress, and so he holds Caswell up. Things get heated pretty quickly between the two criminals. Yeah, between like hulking Caswell and the like skinny, what John Cazal kind of figure yeah. of the cat burglar, you know, like I guess this is the other fight. What were your thoughts on this? Because it's well, played as a very matched, evenly matched fight, which it doesn't seem to be. Well, what you're ignoring is the fact that the two of them don't fight. They invite their stunt doubles in to very clearly <laughs> duke it out. <laughs> Caswell's stunt double in particular is just seen so clearly. <laughs> like, it's just another guy, you know? <laughs> it's not like a guy Fred, who looks... He's wearing the same clothes. What more... <laughs> really, I, Fred? I mean, it's like if Adrian Brody comes on screen and then in the next shot, it's like... Danny Glover fighting someone. Like, it just doesn't work, you know? There were issues with the fight all around. The secondary issue, the one that you're talking about, is the fact that it's, like, this giant buff guy fighting a man who looks about five feet tall. Yeah, never mind giant buff guy who we've, like, the whole episode has led us to believe is, like, extraordinarily dangerous, menacing, evil. And then he gets kind of... Yeah, beat by a guy who looks like he weighs 120 pounds soaking wet, yeah. you know. It's, it's awkward. I mean, I do think that, like, they hit each other with, like, I don't know, the, maybe the cat burglar hits him with the butt of a gun or something like that. I don't know. The the, the awkward fight between the two stunt doubles ends when uh, the cat burglar sort of ironically chokes uh, Caswell with uh, a, a window cord, so he does... Yeah, it know. was... I don't know if you noticed, this was... Uh, he they get to the window and it looks like oh, yes, Caswell's about yeah. to go through. Such a tease! I know I we know, haven't had a window death in. I in made a year. note. He's like the rare bird in the Twilight <laughs> Zone that doesn't go through a window. Yeah. Well, this was early in the series. They were kind of pushing. You know, mm-hmm. how far can we go with a window death? Right. I mean, technically, if he's killed around a window. Yeah. It's like, but if, if you the, think uh, about it, the window is the instrument of death like yeah, it is a window cord, the window so. treatment kills him is that <laughs> can we count that I you, don't know. you gotta guess that the window brags to other windows that he killed him right. he's like oh yeah i definitely killed that guy <laughs> anyway he's dead and then the cat burglar rather intelligently wanders over to the mm-hmm. time travel stuff and kind of starts pushing random buttons and surprise surprise he steps into the time diamond thing and mm-hmm. uh the Glass closes around him, and he gets sent back to 1860, or 1890. I was kind of wondering, did you think that it was supposed to be like a clever rhyme between Caswell getting stuck in the glass phone booth and this guy getting stuck in the time machine, which is also made of glass? Oh, that's interesting. Um, (laughs) I'd like to imagine they had that level of nuance to it, so sure. Okay, good job. Um, We get back to the old west, and the cat burglar is swinging by a rope. And uh, everyone is just kind of like, well, we killed somebody. <laughs> yeah, it's got this like, eh, I bet he's guilty of something kind yeah. of vibe to it. Like, I mean, it probably is in Texas, so <laughs> <laughs> kind of fits. Yeah, I mean, there's like, he's we hanged him, but yeah. he's probably bad. Yeah. Like, as long as someone got hung today. Yeah. Um, anyway, that's the end of the episode. Sterling, what do you got to say? This is November 1880. The aftermath of a necktie party. The victim's name, Paul Johnson, a minor league criminal and the taker of another human life. No comment on his death save this. Justice can span years. Retribution is not subject to a calendar. Tonight's case in point, in the Twilight Zone. Hmm. 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 
Mm-hmm. I like the music. Yeah. Was this one of the episodes where the score was original to it? I feel like we've heard that little um, the, riff this, used in other episodes. This, like, oh, yeah. No, it was stock oh. music cues, but I guess they were just well used. I don't know. I like the, yeah. I like them. Yeah. Anyway, what are your thoughts? Oof. Um, I, Bios oh, no, I don't, and trivia. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if, like, if thoughts would just kind of leap right to reviews. I mean... Yeah. Um, the the other sources I read, including Zikri, kind of really praised Salmi's performance. I think people felt he was mm. giving like a really authentic, interesting, true to the era performance. I I don't know. It's hard to tell because we've seen him. I think in two other episodes now, um, yeah. Cliffordville and Equality of Mercy, and it's just really hard to tell if like he was just an odd duck. <laughs> yeah. Like. But maybe there's it's, nothing wrong with that, you know what I mean? It's I mean, like, no, it's not, know. but it might not be like, oh, he's so authentic as much as like, well... He's got no, a presence. Salmi's just a very interesting... Like, he's like not exactly this, but like maybe it's just like Buscemi. Buscemi yeah. gives you kind of an odd, interesting presence in whatever role he yeah. is. That doesn't necessarily mean he's like bringing something totally authentic perfect to life yeah but um i was thinking like you know when christopher walken hosts snl like <laughs> you know you can pretty much see him reading the placards but it's still fun you know oh yeah he has a total crazy weird energy that's yeah. a ton of fun i think what i like about it most is the grittiness of it it's a time travel episode that easily could go in the direction of like you know the cowboy getting to new york <laughs> city and being like I hang and will beat all this racket, send me back, you know? But instead, it, it turns into this, like, almost film noir type of energy where, like, the scientist is alone in a darkened office and he's, like, smoking a cigarette being like, I don't like you, buddy. You know, like, <laughs> it, it, it just feels, like, kind of small and claustrophobic and gritty and, like, kind of, like, visceral in a way that most Twilight Zone episodes don't. Like, I mean, the second fight is ridiculous, but I... Like, you know, the episode's like 30% fight. That's kind of kind of interesting and cool. I feel like it's more rushed. I, I feel like we kind of introduce this character and then the rest of the episode just doesn't connect with me hmm. once he gets to the present. Yeah, I guess the episode is trying to say that, like, you're going to get your due one way, by hook or by crook. Right. Hater's going to hate. <laughs> but, right. but, you, but justice will be served. If that's the moral of your episode, that's fine. I yeah. guess it's just, it feels rushed, the relationship between the scientist and uh, Salmi. And yeah. then the whole ending is just so contrived. I mean, it like it feels like, oh, this is fits up neatly and there's good parallels. But the fact that, like, you know, 80% of the way through the episode, we meet a random cat burglar <laughs> yes. who's, for some reason, I guess he's, like, from Future Core Inc. trying yeah. to swipe the secrets of yeah. Timeco or whatever. But, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I actually, like, didn't understand what was going on a little bit and was like, wait a minute, has this scientist just, like, is this a person that he transported from, like, the 30s? Is he yeah. just, like, bringing, like, criminals back accidentally <laughs> here and there? Like. Yeah. Well, you've clearly uh, never heard about Chekhov's cat burglar. Right. <laughs> Classic principle of drama. I do yes. like the idea of like a time travel office that just like specializes in bringing forward criminals. Criminals of the Is past. Um, oh, man. It's kind of like that Sylvester Stallone, Wesley Snipes movie, Demolition Man. You remember that one? Sure do. I was like, it was, you know, at the time. I'm sure if I watched it now, I might not feel the same. <laughs> but having not seen it in about... 17 years that was a pretty good movie <laughs> yeah. and the john take is in um, right. <laughs> yeah i agree i mean i think it's like the the message of like justice will find a way is weakened when like it's so contrived to get there right it's like justice didn't find a way there was just like a fluke There's complete like, yeah. utter fluke of fate that, yeah that Sami went back to that office. There's no real reason for him to do that. That he saw this well, like cat burglar at the exact same date. There's yeah. no real reason why that happens. That this cat burglar overpowers and kills him, like in the exact same way. It's like yeah. okay, if if that had been set up better, yeah. If like this, if somehow this confrontation that happens at the end had been a set up before and like built to it, maybe yeah. it would all feel better. But as it is, I get that like. Yeah, it's kind of moody, but I yeah. feel like there were some episodes that were able to achieve that naturally. Yeah. Like the four of us are five. Yeah, four of us are dying. Yeah. Or is it five of us? No, four. Four. The four of us are dying. Or in had, today's like, real... faces. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> awesome. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I feel like they've been able to 
work that vibe and the idea of like mixing atmospheres like western into noir yeah like, could be cool i just feel like it's also half-baked is yeah, my problem with I, the I episode. Hear you. it's really the cat burglar was really the the loose string and in, in all of this i feel like it, it's just far too convenient what if the scientist choked him like i was actually just thinking that yeah. if they could have somehow made it more of a two-hander and the relationship with the scientist and salmi were more developed and <laughs> the scientist somehow kills him but yeah. you find out the scientist is like duplicitous or maybe like in his experiments the scientist kills him when you know for no good reason and then the scientist accidentally gets transported back so he gets hanged so he gets his just dessert yeah. i mean this is all kind of ridiculous spitballing yeah. but yeah. it's just like something could have happened that would have felt a little <laughs> and at the coherent. very end of the, the episode a cat burglar just randomly walks in and is like that's all folks <laughs> and i mean having the priest just be like that doesn't look like a guy <laughs> yeah. but i he yeah. looks bad. I feel like the, I think I think he's he's guilty. We're okay. The, I'm not going to worry about this. The priest this one. sort of echoes your concerns. It's like <laughs> the priest very much kind of gives one of those like I don't know emojis, you know, <laughs> like the shrugging emoji. Well, we hung somebody. Hit the jingle. What we doing next? Bios and trivia. might need to file this under incorrectly regarded as trivia yeah. or yeah. tribute yeah according to imdb the background noises heard aboard the ship in the first scene were later reused in star trek they were previously oh, heard yeah. in third from the sun and elegy i mean he just means like the not the ship but the the science startup the time travel startup i know there are very memorable science fiction noises playing yeah. when like the the I don't know when the professor is like yeah. messing around and and those are the sounds from Star Trek yeah the first combustion engine was invented in 1807 by Isaac de Rivas so odds are that the character may have known about automobiles eh, maybe I don't know I don't know <laughs> about that, that that's also incorrectly regarded as trivia <laughs> it's, like, it's also that's, like I mean, odds are that the character may have known about automobiles like well it's like the Model T was until like 1910 or something like that you know when the Wright brothers had a plane up in the air yeah. even if someone saw it they'd probably be terrified if they saw like f-14s yeah. in the middle of a dog fight yeah. they wouldn't know how to comprehend that so yeah if you like know that a combustion engine exists you yes. still might be terrified of 42nd street i mean yeah. hell people from wisconsin are yeah. every day so yeah do they have combustion engines in wisconsin or <laughs> just to make cheese i don't yeah. know uh, anything else uh, i mean i mean you just been hobnobbing with the the font of all trivia i feel like I know, you should I know. come through with some real gems today i don't know uh these are just some of the imdb goofs so mr caswell acts surprised at the sight of the lighter yet lighters were invented in approximately 1823 oh. you know that's probably yeah people in the old west would have a lighter you'd you'd want one of those so yeah. okay maybe uh mr caswell acts surprised at professor Mannion's voice recording though gramophones have been around since <laughs> 1860 <laughs> come on now <laughs> honestly yeah there's like all these guys out on the trail just going through their rucksack and pulling out their gramophone yeah. oh god that's so annoying and lame i also like how the guy who wrote it says mr caswell <laughs> so yeah, for using the proper like, honorific calling out the, on that guy you can just see him raising their hand to let the teacher yeah. know <laughs> oh mr caswell that's it for my trivia cool. Sigri agrees it's a little ho-hum but he did really like salmi's performance that's kind yeah. of all we get from there um what did, as i what mentioned did grams what did book grams have to say yes. i just i i mean i know him as a buddy he's yeah. like we don't talk about work we just we just connect you know i hear you level. i hear you i hear you i know him all I prefer to you know him from the page exactly in his book uh, Martin Grams of Monster Bashes Mon Martin <laughs> Grams Jr. has a lot of interesting details about uh, the censoring or the suggested censors uh, censoring items I guess in this mm -hmm. episode apparently CBS didn't want Caswell to refer to the Bible as that book but Serling stuck to his guns on that one weirdly they wanted him to take out the line I've been to hell and back and replace it with I've been to hell and now I'm back. Kind of don't get what the difference is there, but Serling went with it. Isn't like the expression to hell and back a little bit more slangy? I guess, maybe, but I don't. Maybe somehow that yeah. would be 
construed as more of a swear than to like, I don't know. It is <laughs> that's really ticky tack. Yeah, but. yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess like if you just say I have been to the place that people refer to as hell, and now I have returned, it's different than like hell as a yeah. swear word. They also took out a shot apparently of Caswell spitting because the network wanted to avoid distastefulness. I'm glad they did. Yes. I don't need to see Albert <laughs> yeah. Salmi spitting. I can. I feel like we got a lot of that in Cliffordville. <laughs> I can live out the rest of my days. <laughs> apparently, actually, a different actor was supposed to play the role of Caswell. He even rehearsed for it. Um, it was Neville mm. Brand, who you may remember from The Encounter. The, oh, okay. The racist. Okay. Yeah, I can. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. Yeah, I can see him fitting in that role pretty well. They both have kind of like a, a heavy type of. Yeah, like kind a, of a tough. rough. Yeah. yeah. Is there any explanation for why he didn't make it? He said it called in sick. Huh. You know, it wasn't like a... Uh, Lee Marvin? Yeah, it wasn't a Lee Marvin special. <laughs> <laughs> I have Lee Marvin's Which disease. I can't make I kind it of. In. Frankly, I could Im- totally imagine Lee Marvin being like number one for this role. So yeah. after he yeah. is Called indisposed in and yeah. the other guy was sick, then we get Salmi. Yeah. yeah. This is just kind of a non sequitur, but kind of fun. You know, when uh, he, he runs into the bar and there's a jukebox playing a song and he smashes it. The song yeah. is Eric Cook's Turkish Delight, which originated from the CBS Talk Music Library. Uh, and the hmm. same music can be heard in an episode we haven't covered called Where Is Everybody? And uh, Corey, James A. Corey, is listening to it in his shack in The Lonely. So, just kind of fun little thing. Uh, what about Bios? Albert Salmi played Joe Caswell. He Mr. Also Caswell, of, John. Mr. Caswell. <laughs> he was also in Of Late, I Think, of Cliffordville and A Quality of Mercy. So, that closes out the Salmi contribution to the zone cool. for us. Do you have a feeling coming down on this performance? Do you I, think I, I liked it a lot, but I do think you have to file it more under, like, christopher walken than daniel day lewis like it's <laughs> it's weird and it's memorable and it's intense like if you yeah. follow the accent closely you're gonna see the seams but uh, <laughs> but i i think he's cool i like him in this episode a lot it's definitely a lot better than of light i think <laughs> it's, of, of of it's a it's a <laughs> cut above that for sure 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 i i mean i don't think he does a bad job or anything i just don't think i don't look at this episode and think like yeah. oh it's a ho hum episode but man Salmi really shines. Yeah. I just think like, yeah he did a decent job. Yeah, it, he's not going to win a daytime Emmy for it. Let me put it that way. John Lormer played the Reverend. Reverend. He was also in Jess Bell, Dust, and Jeff Myrtlebank. Cool. Uh, George Mitchell played an elderly man. He was also <laughs> in Ring a Ding Girl, Jess Bell, and the Hitchhiker. Cool. Been a while since we played. Ring a yeah, Ding. <laughs> yeah. I know. It's been too long. Richard Carlin played the bartender. He was also in the Mirror. Written by Serling, directed by David McDearman. He did a couple episodes back there, A Thing About Machines and Execution. Hmm. Um, well, A Thing About Machines just... was terrible. Right. Uh, um, back there we haven't covered. I actually really like the directing on this episode. I think it's really good. Like, you know, it's in some ways it's the best thing about the episode, the, the, the moodiness that they get out of it and, like, the cool canted angles and the vis- I mean aside from the horrible fight at the end I do think it's like mm-hmm. pretty well di- directed I mean maybe maybe you have a bone to pick with yeah. me on that but I, I thought I liked it the directing wasn't the issue for yeah. me I think it was more script I guess the fact that he had to mix two moods makes it a little higher degree of difficulty but I also I don't find it overly remarkable yeah maybe, no, I, I, in I, the I, same I, way you do uh, so that brings us to the inevitable inevitable so we like to find connections between Mystery Science Theater 3000 and The Twilight Zone. This week, I feel like I got one as I was watching it. Um, I, I know, I, this is I, this is the rare gimme. Yeah, it's it's the, the guy who plays the, the time travel scientist. Uh, mm-hmm. What's his name? What's Russell Johnson yeah, is the actor's exactly. name. He's been in a couple, he's like a kind of MST3K royalty. He's definitely in... Uh, the movie This Island Earth, which they did on Mystery Science Theater 3000, the movie, he plays like the, the cool cigarette smoking scientist. Yes. <laughs> he's really good at playing film noir scientists, basically. Yeah. But I think he's, he was in, been in another one. Most famous as the professor on Gilligan's Island, yes. and he was in a, another episode of Twilight Zone called Back There, which we have not gotten to just was yet. Was he in another MST3K episode, though? He was in The Space Children. Oh, probably yet another cigarette-smoking scientist would be my <laughs> guess. He had... And he was in a couple other B-movies, but yeah. not uh, another cool. Mystery Science Theater one. Uh, so what about IMDb ratings? IMDb gives this episode a 7.4, which puts it pretty well in the average yeah. 
range. Yeah. I hear you on all the complaints. I mean, I feel like, you know, the cat burglar is very convenient. There's like a lot of confusing mood mixing. It's wrapped up in a bow that is a little too neat. <laughs> that even tied. the characters don't <laughs> yes, really exactly. agree with. Yeah. Um, I guess this wraps it up. Uh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, should we feel morally dubious? Nah, no, we're yeah. fine. I still feel like there's just something really, li- not really likable, but there's something I like about it. I just, I like the darkness and grittiness of it, and I like, you know, uh, Salami's performance. I mean, it, it's not amazing, but it's like visceral, and it, it feels emotional more than just like a, I'm a mean old hombre. So, mm-hmm. I don't know. I, it's not great, but it's like maybe in the seven, six plus area for me. Okay. Well, I, mean, I, I gonna, you know, hit, you know, hit me with your best shot. I'm Oh, I'm not going to say this is a bad episode. Right. I'm I'm not getting there. I just think it's a I think this is very much a 5. This is what I mm. think of with a 5 where you got it's an okay performance. It's okay directing. You know, the performance maybe is a little you know, maybe a little better, but the like writing and the ending yeah. is weaker and I honestly have trouble remembering what happens between yes. like when he disappears from the past until he gets like he and the cat burglar have a fight. Like somehow there's 15 minutes of episode, but it feels like there's like four minutes of episode. Yeah. I can't really remember well, how it's it plays just, out. It's like, just basically him not liking the present day. <laughs> it's just a right. lot of that. It's that beat over and over again. It's a five for me. It's very forgettable. Right, well, it's, it, I can see how it could connect with some people. I could see how some people might think it's worse. I just think it's, like, forgettable. Yeah, I hear you. Six plus for me, five for you, and that's a wrap. Mm-hmm. Um, so thank you to the many people who requested this one, or, or maybe two, I guess, since yes. <laughs> many would be optimistic. <laughs> 20% of our listening audience <laughs> is just desperate to hear this. Yeah. Uh, so thank you very much to Astro Borealic on Tumblr and Dylan on Facebook. Yeah, especially Dylan on Facebook. He's written up, written us some nice notes. Well, thanks. Thanks to the Dill man. Next week, we're going to do another request, but you're going to have to tune into our social media to find out what that's going to be. We have lots of social media, and there's also lots of ways to get in touch with us. John, what are they? Well, you could send us an email at twilightpwn at gmail.com. You can get in touch with us on Twitter at twilightpwn. You can check out our website, twilightpwn.com. You could like us on Facebook. At Twilight Pwn, I guess. I don't know. Just search <laughs> just for it. Type in Twilight Pwn on Facebook. Yeah, it'll all sort out in the wash. You can listen to us on any kind of podcatcher, and you could subscribe to us in iTunes. If you're over there, if you leave us a rating or review, we would really appreciate those. Thanks very much. So, Fred, I mean, what was your favorite part of hanging out with MGJ today? <laughs> I, oh, knew, I knew we'd come back to Monster right. Bash. <laughs> oh, well, I can tell you one more chestnut from uh, oh, yeah. Monster Bash. Please. Because everyone's wanting to hear this. File this under the inevitable MST3K connection. Oh, yeah, right. I got to meet a famous director who did a number of pictures that were featured on Mystery Science Theater, Mr. Bird Eye Gordon. Exactly. Did, uh, the Magic Sword, Attack of the Colossal Beast, War of the Colossal Beast, quite a few of them. And uh, I just went ahead and took my foot, got it shined up, and just <laughs> shoved it in my mouth for the entire awkward, you know, maybe three to five minute interaction. And yeah. he seemed like an extremely nice older man who we just didn't hit it off at all. <laughs> and And when things were getting really desperate, I mentioned how... I'd come to learn of his work through Mystery Science Theater, and you could just see the light go out of his <laughs> eyes, and I felt really horrible and walked off. And did you buy his book, John? It was a little pricey <laughs> for me, and I I felt really bad that I didn't. I felt ashamed, and I kind of wanted to just hand him a 20 <laughs> yeah. and be done with it, but nothing that he was selling was at that $20 <laughs> price point, and so I didn't right, know how right, to handle right. it. We'll make it up so. to him. We'll put a link up on the Tumblr. <laughs> All right. soon the legions of ponies will be financially supporting him. Okay, right. I'll talk cool. to you next week. All right, later, friends.